Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of different topics here under the, the broad uh, umbrella of collective construction. Uh, so large numbers of agents building interesting things together. Uh, and the core inspiration uh, for all of this work has been mound building termites. Uh, so the photo on the left here is an example of a termite mound. Uh, this is actually a particularly small one. The, uh, the record for these is more than 13 meters tall. Uh, from the outside, it looks like a pile of dirt. Uh, from the inside, it's got all kinds of complicated internal architecture. So if you fill the mound with plaster and wash away the dirt, you get the photo on the right. This is showing the network of tunnels. Uh, and these are performing a role for the colony. They're, they're helping with atmospheric regulation. Uh, and the whole thing is built by millions of independent insects. Right? Uh, each one is limited. They don't know what the others are doing. Uh, this is a bit dark. I guess you can't quite see them. But uh, you know, they don't know what the overall state of the mound is like. It's not as though they're getting instructions from the queen. Somehow all of these uh, termites going around, encountering whatever they encounter and doing their thing, wind up producing these huge complex structures. So there's kind of two directions you can go from that. Uh, one is to say, that's amazing. What is it that these termites are doing, and how does that lead to the things they build? And the other is to say, that's an amazing proof of principle that that kind of thing can be done. So how do we engineer a system like that? How would you build and program an artificial termite colony uh, to build for you whatever it is you ask them to build? Uh, so there's kind of two different uh, sides to this question here, right? There's, there's the forward question, uh, the scientific one, of uh, given a set of, of agents and the rules that they're following, can you predict uh, what that's going to uh, produce when they all build together? Uh, and then the, the inverse question uh, is more of an engineering one. Given a particular structure that you want built, can you come up with a set of rules for a bunch of independent agents uh, that will wind up producing the thing that you asked them for? Uh, so that's the, uh, the macro-micro problem that uh, uh, Marco was talking about yesterday. So the, um, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the second of these problems, the, uh, the engineering one, and then hopefully spend most of my time talking about uh, exploring the, the first question, uh, our study is trying to understand more about what it is that the actual termites are doing. So the, uh, the project that I want to talk about uh, briefly to start with uh, is what we call the Termes system uh, from a few years ago. So this is a, a collection of uh, independent climbing robots that uh, use this specialized building material uh, to build structures according to what the user asks them for. So the idea is uh, the robots are independent, they're limited. You can give them uh, a picture of what it is that you want them to build, uh, and it doesn't matter how many robots there are, uh, it doesn't matter which one encounters which tasks there are to do, in what order, with what timing. Uh, despite all that kind of unpredictable variability, uh, you can write down provable guarantees that all of them working together and following these automatically generated rules will wind up producing uh, exactly the thing that you asked them for in the first place uh, without getting stuck along the way. So uh, this is a system where we really tried to have, on the one hand, the, uh, the firm theoretical underpinning that lets us say, you know, you can ask for a particular result and have a guarantee of getting that, uh, and then carry that through, and on the other hand, have uh, a physical system showing in hardware that the things that we're asking of the robots are reasonable things to be happening uh, in real life. And the, uh, the approach, uh, as well as the, the problem, uh, was inspired by termites. So we've got independent robots. Uh, they're limited to what they can sense themselves uh, with their own sensors and their own bodies. They don't have anything like an external camera. They don't have GPS. Uh, they're building large-scale things. Uh, climbing over the structures in progress to get to places they couldn't otherwise reach. So the size of what they build is not limited by the size of the robots. Uh, and they're coordinating via this traditionally termite-inspired idea of stigmergy. They're looking at where material has already been put down and using that to help them decide uh, where to put additional material. Uh, so I don't have time to talk about this system in a lot of detail, uh, so I thought it might be interesting to talk about it through the perspective of a couple of key ideas uh, that we relied on 
uh, that I think were really instrumental in getting the system to work. Uh, these may be familiar ideas, right? So the, the, uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, to make use of the physical world. Uh, so this is an idea you'll sometimes hear talked about under the name of uh, mechanical intelligence or morphological computation or other names. Uh, and the idea is that if you can design a system so that uh, the physics of the world handle certain tasks for you, then that's, those are things that you don't need to deal with uh, with an explicit controller. So for instance, uh, the blocks that these robots maneuver on and, and build with have these sort of bowl-shaped indentations on top. Uh, and when a robot is turning in place, those bowls help keep the robot uh, from falling off the structure, uh, so it doesn't need to worry about turning very precisely. Uh, when they put down a block, they don't need to worry about putting it down very precisely. They put it down in about the right place and kind of move around a bit, and the, the physical features slide the block into precise alignment, and it locks in place. So that's a way that the robots are using the physical world to help with physical manipulations. Uh, another way they're using the world is uh, to help with localization. So on the upper surfaces of these blocks, there are these black and white uh, markings. On the bottom face of the robot, there are six infrared sensors. So this is basically a six pixel black and white camera that's looking straight down at what the robot is standing on. So as a robot moves around on top of a structure built out of these blocks, it sees different patterns of black and white, and that helps it keep track of where it's moving relative to the structure. When it's away from the structure, it has the set of ultrasound sensors, uh, and it can use those to tell about how far away the structure is. So in this video, uh, the robot is using the ultrasound to start with uh, to walk around the perimeter of the structure, so using the structure as a reference to figure out where to go. Uh, no other odometry or anything. Uh, and then when it finds this marking on the ground uh, that tells it it should climb onto the structure, uh, once it does, uh, it has these black and white patterns to rely on that let it keep track of its movement in a coordinate system which is physically built out of these blocks. Right? So the structure is playing the role of you know, the structure that they're trying to build, uh, but it's also being used as a, uh, a physically embodied coordinate system for the robots to make reference to. So a second idea we relied on was uh, sort of paradoxically, uh, one of the things that made it possible to engineer this complex system was by limiting the complexity of what could take place. So let's suppose that you want the system to build this step pyramid. Uh, here's a different representation of the same thing. The gray squares are just looking down on the pyramid from above. Uh, and I've added these colored arrows. Uh, the colors are just showing the direction. So like all the green is up, all the red is left. Uh, and these arrows are a set of traffic laws that we've imposed on the robots. So it, it limits how they're allowed to move uh, while still leaving a lot of options open. Uh, and that restricts the, the flow of robots and material through the workspace to a set of sort of limited, consistent uh, ways. So it's a bit like the difference between bumper cars at an, at an amusement park and driving on a highway. You know, with bumper cars, you've got stuff coming in from all directions. You have to deal with a lot of possible things happening. Uh, you have to stop all the time. On a highway, everybody has agreed in advance to drive in the same direction in the same place. Uh, and so that lets you drive very fast uh, and very much more safely. Uh, with the, uh, the flow of material, that also means that very simple rules that the, the robots follow uh, are sufficient to allow building uh, in an effective way. So like if you're building a brick wall, you, know, you don't just add bricks in a random order. You build each row of bricks starting from one side and, and going in a consistent direction uh, because that's obviously the way that makes sense to build a brick wall. And if the robots and material are coming from a consistent direction, that makes it easy for them to build in the same kind of effective way. So one of the features of the Termi system uh, is that you can ask it for a particular blueprint, and it'll build you that thing. Uh, and I think that's useful for human-relevant construction systems, uh, because you know, typically we like to know what we're going to get in advance. And we like rectilinear structures. We like regular buildings. And if you had a, uh, an automated construction system that uh, gave you some weird, lumpy, organic-looking thing, uh, you know, you'd, you'd be unhappy with it. Uh, I say that. I mean, there are exceptions, right? But uh, 
typically, you know, we know what we want when we start. But you can also imagine situations where you don't actually uh, want to have to specify a, uh, a final design in advance. Right. Imagine you've got a, a robot exploration system, uh, and at some point they come to a river, and you want them to get to the other side and continue exploring on the other side. Well, you don't want to have to tell them exactly what they need to build to, uh, to build this bridge. You don't want to have to get out there and survey the exact details of the terrain on both sides. You just want the robots to deal with it. So maybe they start building a cantilever, and as that extends, they need to go back and add more material to, to reinforce the... Um, uh, the anchor where they started, and eventually they make it across. Uh, and you don't care about exactly what that bridge looks like, you just want it to be functional. So that's a direction that we've, uh, this is really very dark, but all right, so it is. Uh, this is a direction that, that we've been looking at more recently, uh, looking at uh, a, a problem of climbing robots building with these uh, triangular uh, truss structures, uh, where the idea here that, that we're relying on is uh, that as robots move over the structure, that's going to change the, and as they add material, uh, that changes the internal forces uh, within the structure. And we're going to let the robots measure those internal forces and use that to, uh, uh, to help them decide what to do. So the blue and the red lines here are meant to be showing the locations of force sensors. Uh, so the idea is when a robot comes to one of these nodes, uh, it's able to, to evaluate the forces on each of the struts coming out of that node and use that to decide, uh, is it a, safe to venture out on a cantilever or do we need to go back and add more reinforcement somewhere else? And uh, you know, to summarize the, the, the upshot of this, uh, by paying attention to those forces, it's possible for robots to build uh, cantilevers that extend much further out, unsupported over gaps, than if they're not paying attention to those forces. Uh, they can get to much longer distances before the structure fails, uh, either you know, because it breaks through uh, poor decisions made up until now, uh, or another possible failure mode is the whole structure can overbalance and topple into the chasm. Uh, those failure modes are put off much longer. Uh, and uh, Nathan Mellenbrink, who's the student who's been working on this, has also been developing uh, prototype hardware, uh, both for a... Uh, a robot that could maneuver on these kinds of, of structures, uh, but also for sensing hardware to make that force information available. So all of this work that I've, meant, that I've been talking about uh, has been inspired by termites, right? I showed this slide earlier. But this, this inspiration is in a very high level way, right? The details of what the robots are doing are very different from the details of what termites do. And there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, but one of those reasons is that uh, there's actually relatively little known about the details of what termites do. Compared to the amount of work that's been done on ants or on bees, termites are relatively understudied. Uh, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. Right? One is that termites are not uh, incredibly charismatic animals. Uh, and I think our relationship with them tends to be somewhat adversarial. Uh, so here's a book that I took out of the Harvard Library at one point. Uh, I think this really sums up you know, the usual uh, human outlook on this. So uh, a lot of the work that's been done from the, uh, on, on termites is actually from the perspective of pest control. Uh, so let's say you do want to study termites. Uh, if you want to study the ones that build mounds, uh, another problem is that they're relatively inaccessible. So the mound builders don't live in North America, they don't live in Europe. Uh, to study them, you have to go to the other side of the world. Uh, we travel to Namibia. And once you get there, uh, the termites live in an impenetrable fortress. So, you know, what do you do? Well, uh, you could put a hole in the mound and, and put in a uh, camera on a, uh, uh, on a cable <clears throat> and, uh, and see what's going on inside. And what's going on inside is kind of a mess. Uh, you can, it's, again, it's, this is dark, but you can sort of see there's a huge number of termites. It's impossible to keep track of individuals over any length of time. Uh, it's a completely uncontrolled environment. Another reason that this is not an effective way to study uh, termites is that this happens within a few minutes. Anything you put into the mound gets covered in soil. Uh, so instead, we take termites out of the mound, uh, we bring them back to the lab, uh, and we, we put them in petri dishes on lawns of soil, which is the traditional way to look at them in the lab. And, uh, 
record what they do. So the reason that we're in Namibia in particular uh, is our collaborator, Scott Turner, uh, had identified this very interesting situation where we've got uh, two closely related species of termites. So there's Macrotermes michelsoni and Macrotermes natalensis. And morphologically, they're almost completely indistinguishable. Uh, in fact, they're, they're so identical when you look at them that I haven't actually bothered to show you photos of the two different species. These are both michelsoni. Uh, but they look the same. Uh, but the, the mounds they build are completely different. Uh, so uh, Michaels and I build these tall, impressive spires. Uh, and it's a little hard to see the scale of this because of the height of this tall grass, but that's a cow. Uh, and Macrotermes natalensis build these low, spireless, uninteresting looking things. And so our hypothesis was, we'll go, we'll study their behavior, we'll identify behavioral differences, and then we can connect the differences in their individual behavior to the differences in what they build. And we keep getting sidetracked uh, because things that we think we know going in turn out to give us surprising trouble. Uh, the, the biggest example, I think, is that the, uh, the central idea uh, for many decades as to how termites coordinate their building activity is based around the idea of a cement pheromone. So one termite puts down a blob of material, it puts in uh, this, uh, this chemical, Another termite comes along, it smells the chemical, it says, okay, I'm going to put down my own blob of material here with more chemical, and so the, uh, there becomes this positive feedback loop with an accumulation of material and accumulation of the pheromone, uh, and you wind up getting uh, pillars and so on built. Uh, but in recent years, uh, there's been an increasing body of work that's been casting question on the role of a cement pheromone as traditionally viewed. Uh, or, or even actually on whether uh, such a thing as a cement pheromone as is traditionally conceived exists. Uh, so the traditional view of uh, termite construction activity is very much focused on deposition. Okay, so here's a uh, sort of a, a cartoon flowchart of uh, how termites or termite construction activity is usually modeled. So termites are walking around not carrying anything. At some point, they decide to pick up a pellet of soil. Then they walk around carrying it. At some point, they put it down, and they keep doing that. And the interesting thing here, the highlighted square, is how do they decide where to put it down? And that's you know, the idea centered around the cement pheromone. Uh, where they get the soil from uh, is not usually considered as interesting. Uh, there's a lot of modeling work uh, actually, that uh, in some models, they just completely ignore the, uh, the, the question. Um, the simulated termites are assumed to come into the area uh, where they're working already carrying soil they brought from somewhere else. Uh, in other cases, they do pick it up from within the area, uh, but uh, more or less at random. Uh, and there isn't, in general, thought to be a, a, an important relationship between where they're getting the soil from and where they're putting it. So based on, uh, on that view, uh, okay, I wish you could see this a little bit better, but maybe you can kind of make it out. So we put termites into a dish uh, and expected to see accumulations of soil in a few localized places uh, and divots where uh, soil had been removed more or less at random uh, through the dish. Uh, and you may have to take my word for it more than I thought, but that is very much not what we saw. Uh, we definitely saw accumulation uh, in a few places. But those places were exactly the same places where they were getting the soil from. Uh, so there'd be a, great. Uh, so there's a period where the termites are just milling around uh, before they start digging. Uh, and then they start digging in a limited number of excavation sites where they've all apparently decided to dig at those few places in common. Uh, and it's around those excavation sites that material builds up. And I really hope you can see this. But if you, if you look at a single termite digging, uh, what, what you wind up seeing is uh, it goes and it gets a, a pellet of soil from a dig site. And it moves to the side and puts it down and goes back and, and keeps digging. And uh, to be unforgivably hand wavy and anthropomorphic, uh, what this looks like a bit is uh, you know, imagine that you're, you've got a shovel and you're digging a hole. So you take your first shovel full of soil, 
and now what do you do with it? Right? You're gonna dump it out to free up the soil for the next shovel full. And so as you keep digging, you wind up with a pile of soil, but not because you're trying to make a pile, because you're trying to dig a hole. And what we see is at least consistent with that kind of view. Uh, the, uh, the piles of soil are all building up on the edges uh, of the excavation sites. Uh, so uh, it looks as though the, the excavation sites are the template uh, for where the, the depositions are occurring. So, uh, so that suggests uh, a, a different sort of basic model for, uh, for how termites are behaving in these, uh, these early stages of digging. Uh, they're moving back and forth between two states, in one of which they're moving through the arena without manipulating soil, uh, and in the other, they're in this sort of excavating mode where they repeatedly get a pellet and put it right nearby. So the, uh, the termites' apparent focus on uh, excavation uh, made us say, let's ask some questions uh, also focused on excavation. Uh, so I will talk here only about the second of these, uh, the underlined one. Uh, let's suppose that you're a termite, you're walking through this, uh, this arena, and you come to a, a place where digging has been going on. Uh, you have a choice. You can either stop walking and start digging at that existing excavation site, uh, or you can ignore the site and keep walking. How do you make that decision? What influences that decision? Uh, so we considered uh, a bunch of different candidates that might have an impact on that. Uh, and these fell broadly into three categories. So the first was characteristics of the individual termite walking by. Uh, there's what we called excavation propensity. This is just how much time it spent digging in total in the course of the full experiment. And I'm gonna wave my hands again and say this is something like termite personality or mood. Some of the termites just seem to be more interested in digging than others during that experiment. Uh, mobility level, same idea. Some of them were more active in walking around than others. Uh, those might have an impact on, on uh, whether they joined in digging. Uh, and we also looked at these two different species thinking we might see differences. There's a second uh, category of traits that have to do with that termite's memory. So if I come to an excavation site, was I the one who originally started digging here in the first place? Have I been digging at this site already, uh, earlier in this experiment? Have I been digging anywhere in this experiment? Maybe that's gotten me into the mood for digging. Uh, and finally, we looked at characteristics of the site itself. How many other termites are currently excavating there? What's the size of the digging party? Uh, how much excavation has already taken place here? Uh, and so we, uh, we used a model selection procedure uh, to statistically uh, look at all of these candidate features uh, plus combinations of species with the other seven. Uh, and uh, the model selection uh, told us how many, excuse me, told us which of these features uh, were actually the important ones influencing that decision uh, and how important they were. Uh, and uh, we had a big pile of data, and the thing that I want to emphasize here is that we were only looking at the first 10 minutes of construction, uh, because much longer than that, and termites are disappearing under the tunnels they're building, uh, which means this overhead camera view of, of looking at what they're doing stops being useful. Uh, so this is, this is really just initiation of construction. It's possible that things change uh, at much later stages, but this is what we've studied. Uh, so. The, uh, the upshot of the analysis uh, was that one strong factor influencing the termite's decision, should I join in digging or should I keep walking, was just ex its excavation propensity. That again is the, you know, the personality or mood, how much do I like digging? Uh, but just about as important was how many termites are already digging there at that moment. So for every additional termite uh, digging there, my odds ratio of joining in uh, digging increases by a factor of more than four. So that seemed to be a pretty strong effect. Uh, and then there were also uh, much weaker effects, but the, uh, the analysis said they, they should be considered uh, from the total amount of building that's gone on at the site uh, and also the mobility level, again, sort of the, the termite personality. So the number of term, uh, sorry, and that's it, that was it. Uh, everything else got eliminated, eliminated by model selection, uh, including species differences, 
we couldn't actually find a difference in this respect between the two species. So the number of termites seems like a really important factor here, uh, which makes some sense in retrospect. Uh, termites are social cockroaches, uh, and there's a body of work about uh, other cockroaches uh, and their attention to aggregation. Uh, you know, so the, the, the not specifically social cockroaches like to gather together in the same place, so it's maybe not surprising that uh, the termites, the social co cockroaches, uh, would be paying attention to where others are and what they're doing and helping them decide what to do. Uh, okay, but there's also this issue of how much digging has gone on at the site, and that could be influencing what they're doing, and so we wanted to try to disentangle these two features. So in order to control for uh, what an individual termite uh, might remember, uh, to control for the size of the site that it comes across, because you know, a larger site might be more attractive, uh, and for any possible chemical cues that digging at a site might leave there, uh, to control for those things, we looked at all the cases we had where uh, the termite had never been to that site before, uh, where at most one minute of excavation had taken place there, so the site didn't have a chance to grow too large, uh, and excavation took place there very recently. So if there is a chemical trace, it shouldn't have had a chance to fade. And of all of those cases, uh, in the cases where other termites were engaged in digging, uh, about a quarter of the time, the wandering termite would stop and, and join in digging. Uh, and when, there, when the site was unoccupied, we never saw the termite stop and, and dig. Uh, so the number of termites working there uh, really seemed to be the, the most important factor. So we've got then an alternative to this traditional deposition-focused flowchart. Right, so here's you know, another cartoony flowchart, uh, but this is one now focused on excavation. So this is going back and forth between wandering through the, uh, through the arena and being in this deposition mode, uh, where the interesting thing is how do they decide whether to join in a site where others are, uh, uh, are digging, uh, and the, the important factor is how many of them are currently digging at that time. So here are two flowcharts. We're computer scientists, uh, so you know, we can code these up in a simulation. And uh, really, just as a sanity check, uh, let a you know, simulated uh, arena of termites dig according to either the deposition-focused uh, flowchart or the excavation-focused one, uh, and look at how patterns of deposition and excavation uh, wind up uh, accumulating. Uh, and you know, as you'd expect, uh, the, the deposition focused one, as I said, this is a sanity check, right? So deposition focused one, you get uh, accumulations of material, but excavations are uh, fairly randomly scattered, uh, more of a, um, a preponderance around the edges uh, because termites are spending more time around the edges, but there's still, uh, th there's still a scattering of excavation sites. In the excavation focused model, uh, you've got a limited number of shared excavations uh, with depositions sort of lining their edges. And again, that's closer to what we see in the, uh, the actual uh, dishes. Uh, you completely can't see this here, but uh, if I uh, highlight the deposition excavation sites, hopefully it's, it's a little bit clearer. Uh, so that's a qualitative comparison. Uh, you can do a more quantitative comparison as well. You look at different uh, metrics of what's going on uh, during this uh, early stage of construction, especially metrics focused on excavation. Uh, and the excavation-focused model seems to capture better what the termites are doing. And uh, you know, it doesn't capture it perfectly. This is not meant to be a, a complete model. Uh, but in terms of a simplified first pass, uh, it seems to be better capturing uh, some of what the termites are doing uh, better than the, the traditional deposition-focused model. So that's some stuff about uh, how termites are influenced uh, in their excavation uh, by this factor of aggregation. Uh, another thing we really wanted to look at was how is their building activity influenced by the shape of what they're building? Uh, right, I mean, as they're creating piles, uh, that's creating a shape that they might be responding to. Uh, and that's something that we've been interested in, uh, in particular, for a long time. 
Uh, this is uh, a factor that uh, goes back to some earlier studies. This is uh, a study that actually really influenced me when I was getting to this area. Uh, the building agents in this system are looking at local configurations of material, and they're really just looking at where material's already been added to decide where to add more. Uh, that's the reason that that was the approach uh, we took in the Termi system. The robots are looking at local configurations of material to decide where to add more, uh, but only you know, physical configurations and not anything like a, a chemical trace. Uh, there's some evidence for that being an issue uh, with termites. So there's a study with uh, a different uh, species, uh, non-mound building, but, but still termites, uh, which found that the, the shape of uh, something built up in an arena seemed to be a stronger cue for uh, termites to go and, and dig around it than the smell of something in the arena. Uh, and uh, this is something that's been taken into account also in studies of other species. Uh, the shape of what they build uh, will sometimes influence where they add more material. So we wanted to ask, uh, how does the, the curvature of the surface that the termites are standing on affect where they like to spend their time? Uh, so. We printed this uh, sort of weird structure, uh, and the idea is that every point on the surface, uh, right, so we, we, we will coat this with mud uh, and record where termites are spending their time. Uh, and every point on the surface is associated with a curvature. Uh, and of course, it's also associated with other measures. Uh, each point has a slope, each point has you know, a height above the ground, and any of those things could be affecting uh, what termites like to do. You know, maybe they like to, to climb to the highest available point. Uh, so you can disambiguate those, uh, those features uh, by putting this, uh, this surface in different orientations. Uh, and that changes the inclination of each point, it changes the height of each point, uh, but it doesn't change the curvature. Uh, and so in any given orientation, you can say uh, you have a map of what each of these quantities is at each point. Uh, and if you look at where the termites are active, uh, it matches pretty well with curvature and not with the other two quantities. And same idea, if you tilt this in different ways, uh, the inclination map changes, the height map changes, the curvature map does not. And consistently, uh, activity <coughs> maps pretty well to curvature. Uh, so this, uh, it's, you know, it's a reasonably high correlation, um, and not with either of the other two quantities. So, Again, this isn't a perfect correlation with curvature. Uh, this is not capturing everything that termites do. Uh, but the idea is that this is a piece of the puzzle. Right? And, and so what we're trying to do is to assemble these pieces uh, and ultimately to be able to put them together and to, uh, to then uh, predict in uh, the longer term uh, on longer time scales uh, and on larger spatial scales uh, to understand what it is that, uh, how it is that the termites are building uh, how it is they wind up producing these uh, large-scale complex structures. Uh, and it may also be that the insights that we learn from that wind up being useful in creating uh, artificial systems to be building human-relevant structures for our own use. So uh, with that, I would like to thank my collaborators in this work uh, and our funding sources. Uh, and I guess I've got a few minutes for questions.